Okay, so thank you everybody for coming. Uh, just to repeat, because a few more people have joined since I started. Um, this is a Transition Chesterfield and Derbyshire Climate Coalition Eco Homes Workshop on Insulation. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, heating our homes is one of the biggest sources of carbon emissions, um, as well as a you know, massive personal cost. And 70% uh, of homes in the UK don't meet sort of basic energy efficiency standards. They're not even EPCC rating. We've got four speakers this evening who are gonna to talk to us about what they've done to their homes to insulate them, make them warmer and comfier and reduce their, their heating bills. Um, and uh, so I think we'll, we'll get started in a second. So just to say, we'll, we'll have four speakers talking and then we'll have Q&A and discussion at the end. If anybody wants to raise a question or put a comment, you want, if you've got a question, please put it in the chat box. Just do a queue and then your question or just write a comment in there. Um, hopefully the presenters may be able to answer some of those in the meantime, um, but we will try and answer those at the end. And we will do a write up and have a recording of this session. So if we don't get through all the questions, we'll try and answer those in the write up. So, um, uh, and just to say, I'll leave my email at the end. So if anybody wants to join um, Transition Chesterfield's mailing list, Derbyshire Climate Coalition's mailing list, or Chesterfield Climate Alliance's mailing list, um, I'll leave my email in the chat box at the end and just, just get in touch. Um, so I think we'll, we'll get started. Um, thank you very much for, to our four presenters this evening. And we're going to start with um, Graham Truscott. Um, Graham, if you'd like to... Uh, to to, to start, I'm just gonna go on to speak of you. I think Graham's got some slides. Okay, hello folks. Um, my story is one about the loft insulation of a 1960s house um, and some of the trials and tribulations and experiments that I've done there and I'm still doing actually. You'll, you'll see as we go through the slides that actually I haven't completed the task yet. And I wish I had, because it's uh, quite cold today. So um, with a bit of luck, you should see an image. Can somebody confirm that there is an image showing? Yes, we can see that. Good, okay. So this is uh, one end of the uh, loft area. And this is showing the work sort of part way through. There's a few interesting things in this image. Um, you'll see some now uh, recycled plastic insulation on the left. That's the brown fluffy stuff. And you'll see several sheets of what looks like polystyrene because actually it is polystyrene. And you'll see some pipe insulation tubes. And basically what I've done here is down the middle of the loft area where I'm going to keep the previous floorboard level, which had no insulation underneath it, I've reused lots of plastic insulation and pipe insulation that I found. I just shoved that under the floorboards where previously there was, there was nothing. Um, the little area, I don't know if you can see my um, uh, arrow here, but uh, at the bottom of the picture centre is two little silver bits. Those are the hinges of the loft hatch, so that's the access to the, to the loft area. When I bought the house, this whole area was bordered over, but there was no insulation down this area. There was some insulation in other areas. Um, this is a, a similar shot to the left of the loft hatch, slightly out of focus, but I wanted to make the point here about the wiring, where I've been advised to keep the wiring beneath the insulation or above it, but don't put the insulation through the, uh, don't put the wiring through the insulation if you can. So that's all that that slide shows. And I've experimented with other different types of insulation as well. In some areas I've got this stuff, thermofleece, and I found this quite difficult to work with really. Um, to my surprise, I thought this would be easier to work with, but the uh, recycled plastic stuff actually seems to be easier to, to cut and move around. Um, this is a view down the other end of the loft area. Again, work in progress. The central area will have some boards over it. Um, the yellow stuff is uh, a rock wool product. 
um, which claims to be recyclable and made out of rock. It's oh, about three times the price of the uh, now plastic stuff. But again, I didn't find any particular advantage in that in terms of working with it. Um, it's no easier to cut, no easier to handle, no easier to lay or anything else than the uh, rock wool, uh, than the uh, now um, plastic recycled product. On the left in this, you see some uh, super foil. This is 40 millimeter foil, which claims to have the same insulation value as 100 millimeters of the now recycled plastic. Now I'm eventually going to be using this right up against the rafters. I had hoped to get to that point before this evening and I do apologize to you that I haven't, so I can't show you that in its final position. But towards the back, to the top of the picture, you'll see some more silver foil. And what I've done there is, in, as I was um, laying the other insulation and uh, ran out of it, I, I already had the, the silver foil, so I put that, I put that down. Um, just to provide something there rather than nothing, but the, the silver foil at the end will get lifted and will get stapled onto the rafters. So I'll have two layers of insulation, one at the uh, ceiling level and then one at the roof apex level. That's another shot of the same, same thing really. Now I'm very conscious of uh, time, so pressing on. This is the whole area before any insulation was put down. Uh, but after I'd cleared out all the rat infested glass fibre insulation that had probably been put down in the in the 70s and that was really horrible stuff to work with, very very nasty, it, it uh, sticks to everything, um, very difficult to cut and particularly because it was rat infested, there were corpses of mice and rats in it, lots of droppings, it stank something awful which is why I had to remove it all uh, unfortunately, I couldn't reuse it. Down the centre area here, we will be putting uh, a little access walkway through to the end wall. Um, to show you that there are some other types of insulation I've been involved with, this is the Whistlewood Common Roundhouse and uh, a very unusual floor insulation, uh, 9,000 wine bottles put uh, neck down in a, a bed of sand and then ultimately covered with limecrete. Um, a membrane, another layer of lime creeks, another membrane, and then plywood and uh, a lino floor. Uh, and in the walls there you see the straw bales. This is actually a load-bearing straw bale structure. It's all finished now. It's been in operation for a couple of years. Not, not seen a lot of use this past year, sadly. But uh, just to show you that there are other cheap ways of doing insulation if you can be bothered to drink 9,000 bottles of wine, for example. So there they are, um, not quite uh, finished, uh, still an area to go there, but uh, well underway. Uh, I don't have a lot more to say about insulation other than use your imagination, experiment with different types, see how you get on, see what works for you in terms of laying it if you're doing the job yourself. And uh, my experience is that the cheapest stuff, the now recycled, I think it's about 85% recycled plastic, is actually the easiest to work with. Um, so I'll pass back to Lisa. Graham, thank you very much for a very uh, nice and, and concise presentation. Just before I pass on, can I just ask you, I know we're saving questions at the end, but can I just ask you about what difference it's made to, the, to your house, the, the, the loft insulation? Have you noticed a big difference? Well, let me tell you what my first electricity bill was moving into this property with an air source heat pump. For the first month, which is before I'd managed to get any insulation down, £397 for a month's supply of electricity. That is supplying heating to the whole house, plus hot water, plus lights and all the other electrical consumables. Um, now, my hope is that we've drastically reduced that, but I haven't had a second bill yet. I have been watching the meter though uh, and it definitely doesn't seem to be going around quite as fast as it was. <laughs> so we shall see, time will tell. Okay that's lovely, thanks very much. Do you, uh, would you mind just, oh that's lovely, thank you. 
Okay, so without further ado, um, we're going to pass on to uh, Dave Warren now. So Dave, welcome and would you like to um, share your screen with us? Yep. Can you see the picture okay? Yep, that's lovely. Yep, well. Right. So, uh, yeah, so the perfect insulated house requires no heating, allegedly. Uh, hello, my name's Dave Warren. Uh, one of my life goals has been to achieve zero emissions. Um, <coughs> not quite achieved it, but uh, so some of the methods I've used is, are external wall insulation. Uh, this was uh, system supplier, in my case was uh, Alumask. Uh, that's not the building firm, it's the supplier system. Uh, it consists of 90 mil expanded polystyrene fixed to the wall uh, with nylon plugs, uh, which is then rendered over. It has a U value of 0.3, if that means anything to you. Uh, the building contractor was uh, AF Construction Services Limited, Mansfield. Uh, it was part of the Green Deal Home Improvement Fund in uh, 2015. Um, the house was built in the 1930s, so a double brick wall with no cavity and in dire need of insulation. Uh, the render was a very poor state and ready for a renewal. I found that one on uh, Google street view. Uh, total cost was 9,900 of which we obtained a government grant of 4,700 so we paid just 5,200 and that's the, uh, the end result there. Uh, the grant effectively made it the same price as having regular render so it was a, a no-brainer. Uh, time taken uh, should have taken Take about two weeks, actually took about a month by the time the scaffolding came down, um, which I made use of to uh, fiddle about with the roof. Um, uh, living with the building works, there was virtually no building work inside apart from having a new soil pipe fitted to the, um, to the toilet. Uh, some of the details can look a bit clunky uh, if you look too close. Things like that's a gas pipe, uh, little bits there where it sort of bumps into the uh, the overhang. Um, the insulation is guaranteed for 25 years by Alumask. Uh, then set about the underfloor insulation. So uh, using the let's try to scroll this up. Cold suspended wooden floors feel much warmer and cosier. Uh, can be installed from above if there's no access below. Uh, the floor in my 1930s house was in quite a poor state with woodworm, so I replaced it all, all the floorboards at the same time. I installed this myself using Superquilt. Superquilt was manufactured in the UK using a combination of 19 layers. Uh, True aluminum foil, wadding, and high density foam. It's easy to work with and no dust, unlike rock wall. Uh, time taken about two days per room, including renewing the skirting boards. Uh, try to make it as airtight as possible by trapping the edges against the skirting boards or walls and taping the joints. Take care not to block underfloor vents, otherwise, your joists will rot. Uh, insulating the rafters. Graham's next job. Uh, during the really cold winter of 2010, the pipes of my solar panel froze. Outside it was minus 14, and in the roof space it was minus 5 degrees centigrade. Uh, time to insulate the rafters. Using relatively inexpensive foil bubble wrap style uh, insulation stapled to the underside of the rafters that raised the roof space temperature from minus five to plus five. So an instant uh, gratification there. Frozen pipes solved. Uh, loft insulation was just a regular four inch of rock wall to the top of the joists. 
Insulating the loft is the most important. It gives you the best, the greatest improvement in performance for the least cost. I put an additional 200 mm of fiberglass insulation at the edges. Uh, room for improvement. Where the loft has been boarded at the centre of the room, it's still the original four, four inch of rock wall. I could put something like loft legs on top of that, which allows for another layer of rock wall and then reboard over the top. Uh, uh, the kitchen floor was uh, the kitchen floor was quarry tiles straight onto rubble mortar floor with zero insulation. The floor was dug up and replaced with kingspan insulation with four inch of concrete on top. Uh, curtains, one that nobody ever thinks about, but uh, good double layered curtains can make a very notable difference on a cold night. Uh, they're also very good at shutting out heat on hot summer days. So this is, so when it's 32 degrees outside, it's 25 degrees inside. Uh, the, in, the indoor temperature would rise very rapidly if we left them open. A six meter square south facing bay, bay window brings in six kilowatts of heat. That's like lighting up the wood stove. So you need to shut that out in the winter. Um, heat recovery ventilation is something, once you've done all this, you house airtight, so you really need to think about um, ventilation. But the best way to do that is to recover the heat. So um, I've installed a, a cheap unit. Uh, to get the best out of well insulated house, ideally you block all air vents, chimneys, temporarily or permanently, and swap extractor fans for heat re recovery ventilation. Of that will suffocate. Uh, continuous, the continuous power consumption is about 40 watts, but possibly recoups 300 watts in heat. The unit costs around 350 pounds, including pipes and vents. Heat recovery is also, effect, also effectively works in reverse in the summer, keeping the heat out and the cool in. Uh, conclusion: Is my house perfectly insulated? No. Uh, however, my heating requirements have been reduced to 1.2 kilowatt of basic low-cost electric heating, i.e. an electric oil-filled radiator or underfloor heating. Uh, annual cost of heating, roughly £550, and the added bonus of no plumbing, uh, stroke, boiler maintenance or cost issues. Um, if you get a chance, Check out my website, uh, Decarbonise Solutions, which is all about trying to live a zero carbon life. And that's, that's about it. Thank you. Dave, that was brilliant. That was uh, so many ingenious uh, ideas there. And um, it looks like you've, you've, you've done a, a very impressive job on insulating your home there. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So we're going to move on to our third speaker, um, Alistair Meikle now. So Alistair, would you like to uh, share your screen with us? Yep, will do. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, that's great. Okay, uh, well, I'm starting with a Google Street View as well, which is, uh, I live in the end house, the greenhouse at the end there. Um, and that's Google Street View catching me walking along the road, which is rather <laughs> interesting. Um, it's uh, it's a, a row of um, four terraced houses. I live in the end one, which was originally uh, two up, two down. Uh, it has an extension put on the side, which was just one room downstairs and one extra bedroom in about 2000 and um, I bought it in 2005. Um, it, actually the, the, um, the walls are double layer brick but they actually have a, it was built in 1895 but there's actually about a one inch gap between the two brick walls rather strangely um, but I decided to uh, put some internal insulation so this is the, um, the original house front room uh, so on all the outside walls, I've built uh, a stud wall and it's been filled with sheep's fleece, um, thermo fleece, as um, Graham showed us. Uh, and yeah, somebody's put a comment in there about cutting it with sheep shears and that's absolutely right. Works really easily. Um, 
so there we go that's that so against the um brick wall there is a vapor barrier and then in some rooms i put some of that foil insulation as well um i can't i didn't do it in every room i can't remember why probably because i ran out um so that's that um looking at the right hand picture that's looking at our party wall uh and in fact those big black things that you can see on the walls and on the floor are sound insulation panels they're one inch thick made from recycled rubber tiles which are glued to the wall um you don't want to know how much glue you need <laughs> uh, i i think each each of those panels needed four tubes of the um what you put in a big gun uh, and even then they fell off the wall. I had to put more on <laughs> to get them to stick on. But they make, uh, my, my neighbour plays the piano a lot and um, they make a huge difference. It's so much louder upstairs because I didn't do it upstairs than it is downstairs. Uh, so um, yeah, the, the sheep's fleece is 100 mils thick on the outside walls. On the front door that you can see there, which of course I didn't cover, um, I've now got a wooden frame which has got some foil insulation which we push into the gap because we don't use the front door. Uh, so um, now the floors, which were just concrete floors, um, that just show, that's the finished room. Um, that just shows you what I did with the floors. There's um, the existing concrete floor. There's a damp proof layer on top. There's five millimeters of cork. And then there's some wood fiber insulation board on top of that. And then there's underlay and uh, the wool carpet, which supposedly is made from sheep's wool from uh, the Chatsworth estate, whether it is or not, I have no idea really. Um, that I feel that insulating the floors like that has made one of the biggest differences there is. Um, the, the, only, the only thing you've got to do there is you've got to trim the door bottoms because obviously the doors are a bit too long. Um, but I think it's made a huge difference. The floors always feel warm when we, when we sit on them or whatever. Um, so this is the kitchen, which is the other old bit of the house. Um, obviously, we had to do a major amount of work in here, as you can see, but I can't even remember how bad it was. Uh, again, we did it slightly differently there because there's the existing concrete floor, then there's a damp proof layer, but I reversed it and um, put the wood fiber insulation board lower down and then six mil of plywood on top and then cork tiles on top of that. The reason for doing that is that I've got a central island and so I could cut a channel in the wood fibre insulation and run electricity and water to the uh, central island. Um, again, the door bottoms need trimming. Um, yeah, that's that. Now the attic we converted to a bedroom and uh, there against the vertical walls we used um, that um, same foil and bubble wrap insulation. And then there's 200 mils of sheep's fleece against the wall, um, which isn't exactly easy to fix because you've got to have enormously long screws and to get through the battens, unless you've got massively thick bits of wood. Uh, but anyway, it went on there. Um, but then the, the sloping bits of the roof, um, I couldn't really afford the space to do that because it would have to be so thick. So we used um, standard, um, Celotex in between the rafters there, and then it's just boarded over. Uh, so that's that. Um, then I I built a straw bale extension as well, and um, that sort of fills in the corner of the house between the original 1895 house and the extension. Now the idea here was that I was going to have a lime creek slab, but when we did it, there were Seem to, well, there seem to be lots of people having problems doing limecrete themselves. And if you don't get it right and it doesn't set properly, you've got to dig it up and start again. Uh, so I didn't feel I wanted, I've, I've tried to do everything in the house myself. Um, I didn't feel I wanted to do that. So uh, the nearest person I could find at the time to do it was in Devon. Uh, and the architect, a, a guy from Sheffield, um, and myself, he was very keen on uh, carbon footprint uh, and he worked out that it was as much carbon 
for this guy to come up from Devon with all his equipment as it was for us to get some concrete locally. So I'm afraid that's what we did. Uh, so the idea is that the concrete slab is within the insulated part of the building. So that picture on the left hand side with me looking fairly miserable is um, there's 100 mils of Celotex and then there's some polystyrene insulation on top of that and around the edge. I can't remember why we were using polystyrene but there was some reason for it. Uh, I, I can't actually remember. Um, and then the, the lower picture is um, after we'd had the slab poured um, and the cement mixer lurching ominously towards the house because there's a bit of a slope out there. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's that. Um, what else have I got to say about that? Sorry, I've got some notes here. Yeah, the, um, the posts that you can see are the oak frame because my straw bale build, because it sort of hung on the side of an existing house, it couldn't be load bearing. So the, the oak frame is, was put up first and the ceiling, and then we put the straw bale walls in afterwards. Um, there are the straw bale walls in place. And uh, the ceiling in the extension, I would sort of was finding the sheep's fleece rather expensive by the stage. Uh, and uh, amazingly, uh, Screwfix suddenly started listing this um, plastic recycled bottle uh, insulation. And, and so I, I rang them up to order some because it was so much cheaper. And um, when I rang up to order it, they said, oh, you're the first person that's ordered that from us. We need to put you through to the people who make it. And so they put me through to this, this company who asked me what my, I took the order, asked me where, my, where I lived. And they said, what, you're in Chesterfield? Well, we're just down the road. We're in Mansfield. So within two hours of ordering it, a lorry had arrived and all the bales were dumped on my drive, which was fantastic, really. Um, so the, the, wooden, the oak rafters are eight inches deep. And then I lowered, I made another sort of false ceiling below that, uh, another eight inches. So there's, there's like 400 mils of um, insulation up there, which is quite good really. And it also brings the insulation level lower down the straw bales. So there's, because there's a, because I had to pack straw, I couldn't put, it wasn't the exact amount of straw bales up to the um, bottom of the roof. Uh, and so I had to, pack straw in there which meant it's not quite as airtight uh, as the straw bales um, so lowering the insulation meant that it became airtight again um, that's that now um, there, there was a wet central heating system in the house which was powered by a back boiler um, i had that taken out and um, We've got an electric powered wet central heating system using the old radiators. And that's the, um, that's the boiler, if you want to call it that. Basically, there's a pipe runs through it uh, in a sort of convoluted pattern. And there are three sort of little immersion heaters in there, in effect. Um, and it just heats the water up as it goes through. And then there's a central heating pump as normal. Um, on the right, these are some figures that um, I... I, well, I still do keep a record of how much power is used, but um, that just shows as we, in, as we put more insulation in and we brought the solar water heating panel online and all the rest of it, it just shows how much less power is being used kilowatts over the years. Um, and, and I think it sort of proves that the insulation did its job because the, the other electric, which is the remain more or less constant, that's the sort of background stuff that we're constantly using like TVs and goodness knows what and so it was the water heating and the central heating becoming less which reduced our consumption so there you go um, that's uh, just an aerial view of the house so that shows how the the house was and how the green paint has faded on the end of the house over the years. That having the house painted dark green actually makes a huge difference because we that, that what you're looking at, you're looking from the south. Um, and on a winter's day when the sun's shining, the walls of the house are really warm because of their dark green. And I mean when I first moved in I was going to paint it green. But now I think I'm going to repaint it dark green again because it makes such a huge difference. 
uh, and that shows the straw bale and extension with um, grass roof. Uh, in between the two skylights, there's an evacuated tube solar panel. Um, and I don't know if you can see, but one of those tubes is a different colour. And that's because I keep finding golf balls from the park next to our house that people have launched onto the roof and they've actually broken one of the tubes, which I'm pretty annoyed about. <laughs> I've actually put um, plastic, um, um, what do I mean? Like plastic roofing over the uh, skylights now. And I've put wire mesh over the uh, tubes in case they get broken by people launching balls up there, which is just incredible. Um, bottom right, uh, sorry, middle bottom is the outside of the straw bell wall uh, building. Uh, all the, the two skylights and the windows are all triple glazed, uh, which makes a huge difference. And it's great, like this morning, the condensation is on the outside of the windows, not the inside. Uh, and then the right hand picture is my hot water tank, which is super insulated. Um, it's run off an immersion heater at the top. There's, uh, there's a coil at the top which runs mains pressure hot water like a thermal store to the shower, so we don't need a shower pump. Um, lower down, there's an input from our wood burning stove. There's another input which I've never used. And then right at the bottom, there's the input from the solar panel on the roof. Um, and in the summer, it makes a, a huge difference. We, the immersion heater barely comes on in the summer. Um, that's it, I think. Yep. I like the way you say that's it. That's awesome, Alistair. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's very interesting how things like just painting the house or a good pair of curtains can, can make such a big difference as well as all the, uh, the tech and the, and the careful planning. But that's a, a really impressive uh, uh, set of insulation there. Right, we're, gonna, we're now going to move on to our final speaker this evening. Uh, we've got Margaret, who's going to talk about her underfloor insulation thing. So Margaret, would you like to share your screen as well? Thanks. Right, can see that? Yeah, I'm just, oh God, is that the, uh, there. Um, yeah, I don't think I'm quite as uh, high tech as knowledgeable as the other speakers, but just a sort of quick addition. Um, we live in a, an Edwardian 1910 house, and when we moved in, I was quite keen to have the um, floorboards exposed. Um, so, uh, oh God, how do you go to the next one on this? I, I've got all these things. Oh, yeah. Um, so we um, sanded them and sealed them with wood, but it um, turned, turned out that it was mostly because I had kids that were quite asthmatic and I read somewhere that it was important that they kind of got air. So to, to manage this, we put in this insulation underneath the floorboards because we've got a cellar underneath and one room in particular was very cold. Now, we find it quite interesting that other people are saying this is what they're using because after a little while we discovered we've got um, woodworm and we thought it might be to do with the way we, we put in this, installed this. Um, so maybe it was to do with the, wood, the woodworm was to do with some other um, floorboards, I'm not sure, but for whatever reason we decided we better get rid of this stuff and change the floorboards. So I, right at the beginning of lockdown, joined a webinar run by um, Transition Buxton um, and they proposed this stuff here which apparently is recycled coffee bags. Um, and we it's jute basically and we put this under our floorboards. Um, I don't know whether you can see how it looks. Uh, I've got a few more pictures. It was quite easy to install, not difficult at all. Because of the expense of it, we went for the low level 
Um, and I think I regret that now, and we could probably have done with another level on it. Um, but it's it certainly made a difference to the, the temperature in this room. And that is it. You're on mute, Lisa. No, the quality would have been the same, but I think the thickness would have been. Um, so there were various levels of thickness. And since we'd never done anything with it before and didn't know, we just chose the, the lower level. Because we weren't also sure about how difficult it would be to to fit it because it's quite tricky underneath it in the cellar. It's quite low. I can't make it here tonight. I am going to ask people to read out their questions and get the presenters to answer them, even if they've answered them already, because I think it might be helpful for people who are who are joining this uh, later. Um, so just I'm just going to go through them chronologically. So we've got a question from Clemens, and I don't know if um, I can't see everybody at once because there's two or three screens. So is Clemens there and would they like to unmute and ask their question or I can ask, answer it for them if they like. Uh, thank you. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, my question was uh, to the first speaker, uh, re the loft insulation. He mentioned that um, the aluminium uh, sort of bubble wrap stuff was uh, a lot better than some of the others. But I was wondering if there was any sort of comparison between new values of the other um, stuff like the recycled plastic, the wool, um, uh, sheep's wool, rock wool, that sort of thing. If, is there a difference? Uh, for the first layer of insulation, I used equivalences of 100 millimetres of the now recycled plastic product. So that was 40 millimetres of superfoil. It what actually isn't the bubble wrap type stuff. It's, it's more of a quilt, uh, in fact. Um, as I say, I haven't fitted uh, most of that yet. I'm still in the process of doing it. Um, but that's what I looked for because I could get 100 millimetres of the uh, now product between the rafters I, I looked for whatever else was equivalent to that for my base layer and then I'm putting 200 millimeters uh, or equivalent on top of that base layer of other other uh, materials so I, I, I've mixed and matched as you saw from one of those images it's a bit of a mess really because I've got bits of rock wool in between bits of um, uh, bit, bits of the now product but the net result should all be the same I, I should end up with 300 millimeters uh, equivalent of now product everywhere across the uh, the base of the attic and then I'll have the quilt uh, on the apex um, that's that's the plan <laughs> don't know if that's any help thank you Graham um, and sorry, there was another question from, from Clemens as well about, uh, I think that was to Dave, asking why the gas pipe is not hidden by the external insulation. Uh, it's to do with the building regs really, they, they need access to the gas pipes, I think there's a like a screw on the top that they can take off and get out and do what they need to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, Got a question from Harriet. Um, Harriet, would would you like to ask the question? Would like to unmute yourself? If you're there. I don't know. I don't know if Harriet's there. Sorry. Um, Hi, I'm here. It's not Harriet. It's Woody on Harriet PC. Um, sorry, I was struggling to find the unmute. Um, yeah, my question is to to David and to Alastair. Um, I see you've uh, insulated your lofts. Um, you've both used the, I think David used the superfoil and Alastair used the, the bubble wrappy stuff, which is what I'm looking to do at the moment. Um, I've been doing a bit of trying to educate myself with what I can online 
and a lot of the sources mention that ventilation is uh, is very important to the life you can end up with damp issues up there and so on now i mean david you've got that heat exchange up there haven't you yeah uh, presumably that serves the purpose of ventilation up there uh, not not really the, the heat exchanger only moves air around in, in within the house itself um, oh. i think what i would say on the venting the the you know the the between the foil and the tiles yeah. is um if you've got sort of breathable roofing felt like the modern stuff's like a woven a woven cloth and yeah. air can pass through it very easily and, um, well, our roof is eight tiles. Um, it's um, clay tiles straight onto the, um, not the rafters, there's horizontal. Yeah, um, so you, you've got um, lats and touchings, you know, basically yeah, water. Yeah, clay tiles hooking onto yeah. the lats. And so the, the wind will be whistling through there like nobody's business oh, anyway, so it, it's very well ventilated. What I would it's say well, is if it, it's <laughs> not built with back pointing, which is quite an antiquated. Um, technique um, but most of that is now dust which is just spreading itself as a fine layer <laughs> across the attic and um, but apparently the back pointing does where it is existing that does reduce um, ventilation that was its um, a part of its concept apparently um, yeah. but uh, yeah I don't want to go insulating up there and then find I'm trapping moisture permeating from the house and causing more problems than I'm solving um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm I'm no expert on regs, but I, I know if it was a modern house, they'd probably have you put in like tile vents in on every joist or something like that. If if yeah. it was, um, okay, my house was like just old. old fashioned felt, roofing yeah. felt, and yeah. it I may find in ten years time all the beams have rotted through, and you know I've got to replace them. <laughs> yeah. But it is an old house and it's an old roof, so. You know, <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay, I mean, I'm looking to use probably Kingspan or, in fact, I noticed some extra therm logos in your loft as well. Um, where was that employed? Extra therm? Uh, well, uh, the Kingspan type stuff. Yeah, um, I used, it was, it was just a very cheap bubble wrap on the roof. Um, yeah. The I think if I was doing it again, I'd use Super Quilt because it's just ever so easy and it's much, there's much more you value to it um oh, thank you yeah okay. uh, i don't know if i don't know if graham or alistair want to say anything about ventilation for lofts um, well for for our loft we we have the uh, the slates just on battens and then there was nothing else um so i just made sure that the um Celotex fitted exactly in between the rafters rafters yeah which sounds a bit like what you've got. Um, whether that's a huge problem or not, I don't know. But that was, what, 12 years ago? There doesn't seem to have been a problem so far. So. <laughs> well, I don't plan on being here in 12 years. So. Don't you? Well, well, I, don't <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> okay. Um, it's somebody else's problem. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Is it Woody? Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll move on. Um, hopefully, I'm getting these in order. Uh, question from Anne about cat doors. Anne, would you like to ask your question? Do you want to unmute? Hi, yeah. Yeah, a bit of a niche question. Of no interest to people unless they've got a cat. But just, yeah, a cat flap sort of creates a lot of draft. And I just, I've searched for a cat flap that's insulated. I just wondered if anyone had found one or could come up with a solution. I've got a cat but it's not insulated it's just a plain plastic window that, that flaps but uh, there is a bit of a draft comes through there but it's not too bad okay yeah. i think alice alistair's got his hand up and then laura as well so alistair you first yeah i found one that was supposed to supposedly didn't let air through but it's, it was quite good to begin with but i think it's got like a magnet which holds the the different flaps in whether it's just got weaker over the years or not but i've got two so i've got we've got like a sort of porch um so i've got one on the outside and then one on the next door coming inside but they leak air i mean it's um, yeah i don't know i'm not <laughs> sure you can <laughs> stop it really 
Yeah, I'm convinced it's a it's a marketing opportunity for yeah. somebody <laughs> to invent something. <laughs> those that I, I wonder if those you know so you can get some, can't you? That the cat has to have like a magnet on a collar so they can get mm. back in. I don't know if mm. they might close properly or not. I don't know. So yeah, Laura, do you have a solution for this? No, no, not at all. We had the magnet one and that worked really well. Till they came back one day trailing all these sort of like I don't know, screws and just loads of stuff, magnetic stuff that they picked up along the way. It was very funny. Uh, but I just thought, I thought, Anne, what you need is just a heavy curtain over the top. And then I was thinking, no, because then they've got to open the curtain to get out again. So I didn't really think that through properly because you could. <laughs> okay, right. Um, and I, I presume it's, it's not just cat flaps, it's also letterboxes, uh, also leak air, anything that, that's got a gap in it. Um, uh, just coming on to a, there's a, there's a long comment from Carl here. Carl, would you like to, would you like to sort of speak to your comment or voice your comment for the recording? Not really, but I will do, same as you've asked, Lisa. <laughs> um, have a look at um, a system called Q QBot on the internet. Just put QBot into a search engine, Q-Bot. And what this system is, is um, a way of insulating under timber suspended floors using a robot. And all you need to do, provided that the moisture level below the floor is less than 17%, um, which QBot will check first as part of their survey. You, li you just lift one short section of floorboard and put the robot in under the floor. And then the robot um, finds its way underneath the floor and sprays the underside of the joists and the floorboards with this, um, with this foam, which is the same sort of stuff as expanding foam that you use, built building expanding foam. Um, <clears throat> the, the benefit of this is that you eliminate any any air gaps and you also prevent any thermal bridging through the, through the joists. Um, so um, the only problem is that this is oil based, um, so it's not not very eco, um, but it's quite um, cost effective because you're not having to. Uh, rip up all your floorboards, which then probably will result in damaged floorboards, which you've got to replace and all, all the rest of it. We're going to have this done as soon as the pandemic is, o is over under the, um, under the Gr Green Homes Grant, um, which is going to pay for two thirds of the cost of it. So it's going to cost us about £600 to do um, both downstairs living rooms, which are about both about 13 foot square give you an idea of how much it would cost. That sounds really interesting. Is there anybody here that's that's trialed this or knows about it? Uh, just wait, I'm just, I mean, I can't see everybody. Um, nobody's waving. That sounds pretty uh, innovative though. No, okay. Um, I'm just looking, I don't think there's any more questions there. So if anybody's got any, oh, Laura, you've got your hand up. Unmute, please. Just a comment, we, we had uh, our last house was an end terrace. The house before that was an end terrace. Oh uh, no, the house before that was mid terrace. The house before that was an end terrace. We always ended up with, with tricky walls, sort of turn of the century, 1904. Then. Before, not that our house was 1904, must be something about 1904. And um, we, had the, uh, we had it externally insulated and that worked really well, really well to solve uh, damp problems and just keep us warm actually but uh, we had we got caught by a cowboy so be very very careful if you do go for these things that you you know literally did a runner in the night and nobody likes to take on someone else's work so just be really careful a warning uh, anyway we were lucky in the end we found someone to uh, take it on uh, well worth doing and the other thing uh, yeah Floors that are cold, um, chill blains, gosh. You have your floor, do do floor. You know, we decided to, I, I squeezed the floor and then we had it, you know, insulated, boards, uh, wooden floor, no more chill blains. Brilliant. Lovely. So Thank there you go. Thank you, Laura. That's great. Um, I, I see in the chat that Dorothea has found a cat plant brand called Pet Safe. 
So uh, sounds like a, a solution for Anne there. Um, and hopefully doesn't, your cat doesn't collect all the screws and metal of the surroundings on the same time. Um, okay, and Clemmers, you've got another question about expanded polystyrene packing. Do you want to unmute and ask that? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I was watching a program a while ago. I think it was about uh, some guy who's building his own house and uh, he, he collects a whole load of uh, waste polystyrene packaging and um, put them into, found somewhere you could go to put them in this big hopper and it would mash them up into little pieces so you didn't have to buy the little bubbles that you get in, um, uh, which got their big cushions and things. You could kind of make your own so you could just collect all, all the bits that people were throwing away. And um, I was wondering if anyone knew if there was either one nearby or where you could get one, because I, I don't know what to ask for apart from a polystyrene masher-upper. Thank you. Has anybody, anybody heard of this? I've seen a lot of shaking heads no? I don't think so. It sounds, it sounds quite interesting. Uh, how about using a garden, um, you know, one of the that you put a, a strimmer, uh, not, well, a strimmer. not a strimmer, um, right? a, a the chipper. Thing that you see, yeah, I wonder if that would work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I, I found it perfectly easy and acceptable to simply cut the waste packaging that I got hold of and just lay it down between the rafters. Um, I dare say, if you're doing a much much larger area, it might be more helpful to mash it back into small polystyrene beads but wouldn't they just go everywhere unless you could get it well stuffed into something? yeah there is that i mean what my what i wanted to use it for is is between joists in the floor so i'd, I'd kind of want to blow it in somewhere so it'd have to be quite sort of mm -hmm. fluid and also you get a lot of the packaging we get is all like random shapes and corners and so it's not really flat i suppose i was quite lucky in that i managed to get quite a lot of mostly flattish pieces um from uh, various neighbours and people who are having things delivered. Um, but they sell you that stuff in some of the DIY stores. They'll sell you sheets of polystyrene. Same stuff. Yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess you're trying to use up the waste uh, stuff that would end up in landfill, are you? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. A bit more eco, yeah. Has, I wonder if anybody here has also used warm cell, which is like sort of recycled newspaper, which is just, you know, you just throw into your loft. Has anybody used that at all? Which is another sort of eco loft insulation? No, nobody's come across that. Okay, so does, I don't see any more questions. So I don't know if there's anybody here that's done anything interesting in their house uh, in terms of insulation that would like to sort of chip in with the ideas for other people. Um, just, just wave if you have, if you've got any experience you'd like to chip in with? Carl. It's, it's not that interesting Lisa but um, our front lounge, um, our house, part of our house is a 1920s house with nine inch solid brick walls so about three years ago I knocked all the plaster, the lime based plaster off the um, lounge walls and had a plasterer come in and um, reline the dry line the walls with um, phenolic foam backed <coughs> plasterboard and then and then skim it and it's made a huge huge difference to the thermal efficiency of that particular room um, and it wasn't that expensive it cost me about 800 pounds for to do the whole whole room so that's that's worth thinking about as well okay thank you uh, yeah. Dave, yeah, Dave Wells. Just, just to underline that, what Carl just said, we've got a, a front room that uh, is uh, two, two of the walls are insulated on the outside and uh, one of those is insulated on the inside as well, like, uh, like Carl suggested. And another, the front one isn't insulated at all because it's, it's stone. And um, I just, just this evening I was, I put my hand on all three walls and you can see the difference between all three walls. So yes, I, I guess it's quite obvious. The more insulation, the better, and it's you know it's very obvious. Okay, thank you, uh, Alistair. Yeah, just um, 
Lisa, our, our, our colleague Andy Holdaway, he did exactly the same as Carl just suggested um, in his um, terraced house with that um, foam back plasterboard. It worked, it was magnificent. It worked really well. And he did it himself. It wasn't that difficult. So, I mean, it costs very little, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to add to that, yeah, we're we're doing that at the moment. We're 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 doing it ourselves with some insulated back plasterboard. But you need to be careful where to get it from because we were going to get some from Jusons, um, and uh, it was eighty quid a sheet or something mental. So uh, we found someone else to, about a couple of years ago. It was about thirty quid a sheet. So um, we found somewhere else that was doing it. I think for about forty, um, which was um, a lot better. So we've got fifty uh 50 millimeter thick stuff on the outside uh walls and uh 25 millimeter stuff on the inside walls which people tell us you don't really need to do but we need all the help we can get in our house so um yeah that, that's as thick as we could get away with really okay thank you um another question i've got to throw out to the uh to general to ge generally throw out is has anybody's ever used a um, thermal imaging camera to work out where the cold spots are in their house? Uh, oh, Carl again. <clears throat> um, yeah, yes, I, I'm going back now to about 2012. I I, um, I actually borrowed a thermal imaging camera um, from um, a friend who was at University of Nottingham and took picture. Not only used the picture to get an idea of where, uh, not only use it to get an idea of where the heat loss was, but actually took pictures as well. So you, you'd actually got a record of where the, the heat, lo heat loss was. And um, it's a very, very good, good, um, good technique to use. And you can hire these things um, from uh, tool hire places. Well worth doing. Okay, thank you for that. Because I think you know, transition. We were thinking of buying one at some point and let you know, loaning it out to people as well. Um, right, I'm just checking. Uh, Laura, did you want to say something about a coalition meeting date? Do you want to? I'm just going to type my email here. So if anybody wants to be added to any mailing list, Transition Chesterfield, Chesterfield Climate Alliance, or Derbyshire Climate Coalition, just email me, and I'll, I'll direct you to the right people. We've got, got some potatoes left for potato day as well. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've got some uh, <laughs> we've got some hot water pipes running down uh, through the walls, and it would be I think it would be valuable to insulate the pipes, but they're very difficult to reach because you can the you can see where they. They go from the boiler to a spot in the loft, and then they go down this uh, shaft. And I'm, has anybody done anything with something similar that would that 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 could be applicable? It's basically the hot water running to our 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 bathroom sink and our kitchen sink. Um, and if we could insulate that space, I think you can see from the roof that a lot of hot air comes out of that shaft and melts the, the frost on the, on the roof right above it. Um, and, and so I think if we could somehow insulate the pipes or the shaft or something like that, it would uh, save a lot of energy heating, heating that water. Alistair? Are, are they in a, like a, a trough sort of thing in the wall then? They're not buried in the wall. They're not, I, as far as I can tell, they're not actually, there, there is some air around them. So they're in a sort of probably a square shaft mm. that runs the height of the house. Wait, are they outside? No, they're, they're, <laughs> well, they're on the outer wall, but, but they're, they may be where the cavity would be, or they may be just inside from that. I'm not. I'm not really sure. Definitely worth insulating the out. If they do anywhere outside, it's easy to insulate those. But if it's awkward to reach, it's tricky. I'm. Not, I'm not very clever like that. Can you, Can you get into the top where they come out into the roof space? 
Yes. Pack it with something. Yeah. 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 Not not easily, yeah. but but but. No, I, Lisa suggested using the recycled newspaper and <laughs> stuff. Perhaps you could blow that down there. <laughs> If it was on yeah. the inside of the house, I'd suggest just block the top end and then all that heat ultimately would just dissipate into your house. If it's on the outside of your house, it's, uh, well, I'd yeah. still block the top. You know, the, the top, that'd be pretty easy to do, just blocking the top and then the, the heat should stay within the, the property, hopefully. Okay. Sorry, Laura, did you ask your question? Um, yes, just before we finish, um, uh, I... Anne raised the issue of having another Derbyshire Climate Coalition uh, meeting of groups to see how we were getting along, what people are doing. I know various groups are doing stuff with the CEE bill, focusing on their councils, the local councils um, meeting to attract all, all Derbyshire groups, climate, climate groups. I'm, I'm unstable, my internet connection is unstable. Beware, I might freeze. Um, so we, I've got, if I threw out, because I'm very aware, we are very aware that people are, groups are having regular meetings. Would the Wednesday the 27th be, would that work for people generally? It would be really nice to, yeah, Carl's got the thumbs up there. Because I know some groups have a Tuesday meeting, some groups have a Monday meeting. We're going to start having a regular hub meeting for the Derbyshire Dales. Um, Christine Cohen has one over in Doveridge. I'm not sure if they have a regular meeting. I know Ashbourne have, have got a new new group as well, newish, you know. So there are popping up. Just um, finished meetings are usually on Tuesdays, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, should we just go ahead with that, perhaps? Oh, yeah. Anyone? Any comments? If, apart from Carl's thumbs up, which is a good sign. I, su I suggest you just go go ahead, Laura, because it's you know it's yeah. impossible to get days that that everybody can yeah. agree on. And also, uh, Anne, I don't know if you want to mention there's a new northeast Derbyshire climate group coming up do you want to mention that meeting <laughs> yeah we're um we've got a bit of a dearth of environmental groups in northeast derbyshire so we're launching a new group uh the first meetings on the wednesday the 20th of january um so if anybody wants details um i'm sort of circulating it on social media and via derbyshire climate coalition or just contact me um, and let anybody know, you know, particularly people from North East Derbyshire that might be interested. And then you can feed back on the 27th. <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to type your email in the chat, Anne. Yes, so I will go. I, I don't see any more questions. Uh, I'm sorry if I, it's my fault if we've, we've missed any. Um, so, as I say, this is this is being recorded. We will do a write up. We will try and uh, you know answer any questions that I've missed. Um, I'm just going to have a quick check if anybody's not waving at me to say. Oh, uh, does this, Terry, did you have your hand up there? No. Okay. <laughs> Nobody else has got anything to say. I think um, we've had four really fantastic uh, speakers this evening. So if you'd just like to join me in, in showing your reaction, you can do a little, there's a little reaction at the bottom. You can do a little clap or you can do that, uh, just to say thank you very much for your time. And, um, uh, and I'm sure, I, I, I don't know if they'd be willing to be contacted separately because I know they've got a wealth of information and knowledge between them. And uh, again, thank you very much. I'm Lisa, this was a Transition Chesterfield Derbyshire Climate Coalition meeting uh, and uh, thank you, you very you much. Put your contact details in the chat, Lisa. I can't see them. Uh, I put transitionchesterfield at yahoo.co.uk. Yeah. So if anybody if anybody wants to get uh, on a mailing list, I will just email me and I will email the respective people in those organisations. But uh, thank you very much for all joining this evening and I hope you found it useful and, and interesting. So just wish you good night and uh, you know at least you don't have a you've got a safe journey home anyway <laughs> thank you all bye bye